So today we'll be starting chapter seven, especially these practices. Um, the main objective is to recognize the two types of questions that will always be useful for making discoveries between data, what type of variation occurs within my variables, and what type of correlation occurs between my, my variables. Is my screen visible? Can you see the book down? Um, down? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, good. Oh, okay. So the next objective is exploit variation within the variables of your observation, deal with outliers and missing values of data, explore the cooperation between the variables of your observation, recognize how models can be used to explore parts of data. Although we'll come to models in subsequent chapters, but just check or see what it's about in, in this particular one. So, Okay, okay, just want to make us familiar with some of the um, terms that will be used in the course of this chapter. Variable, a quantity, could be quality, could be property, and it could be a property that one can measure, value, the state of variable when one can measure it and it can change. So observation, a set of measurements made under similar condition, one value per variable. Most times we have observation in the... Um, rows, then are very actually they are in colons. The value are actually the so I say the data points in those um in those rows. Tabular data observations of variables. And um I've come to realize that most data are always or most data would have to be in tabular form or see rectangular form to for any data analyst to be able to work with them. Like even sound data or video data later have to be converted to like rectangular data or tabular data for a data um, analyst to work with. Tidy data, um, one observation per row. That's like the like um, requisite of tidy data. One observation per row, one variable per column, one per cell. And the picture of tidy for data sets can depend on what you are trying to answer. Okay. Variation, that's the tendency of values of a variable to change between measurements. And um, we have categorical variable, can only take certain values. Visualize, okay. What that means is um, for category variable, it's like having, um, let's use this example, the diamonds data set, we have um, a particular um, column that has fair, some diamonds, the cut where cut column that had fair, good, and um, good, very good, premium, and ideal. And also, that is actually what was um, realized here. We have continuous variables and can take on any set of that values. And it has been visualized with this histogram below. And it's actually the same data set, diamonds data set. It came around the carat school of the diamonds data set was, um, was used for this um, plot. But in this plot, we, we would notice that um, actually it's an histogram, but this actually is a bar chart because it's actually a variable, why this is a continuous variable. So we have to then um, for the continuous continuous um variable. And there's a there's a function it's geom frequency only frequent frequent uh is geom histogram alternative that does not show bars. Um okay, John, I think John wrote this. He said that uh, pipe is can be read as and then then G plus plus to use this plus slightly as read one can read as bit or or and. For the next um, chunk, it's, um, the diamond data set was actually um, was actually reduced, made smaller. This time around, it was made smaller using the filter function, which we come across in our earlier chapter. And we filtered the um, the correct column um, to all diamonds lesser than were were filtered out, and the plot was made. And this is what the plot looks like. So this time around, we have the um, categorical variables of presented in the um, the correct the correct um, axis, and it's because we have just five five um five levels. That's why it's not so um choked up. Still kind of visible, although the colors might be difficult for someone who can distinguish between green and blue to really view um what the difference. It is really 
other than that, we can still um, let's answer some questions from this. This is just a different question. Okay, which values are the most common? From this, we find out that oh, the ideal which values are the most common, and which values are rare? Why does that match your expectation? Can you see any unusual pattern? And what might explain what might explain them? So we start with which values are the most common. And we'll find out that um, we have um, diamonds with craft less than one to be more common. And, and most of them are actually the ideal, um, ideal um, cuts. And also we have, we notice that there are actually some spikes, like spikes around um, one, 1 1.5, two, and some other um, values before that. Um, which values are rare? Beyond two, find out that the plots, like the, the plots reduces good. Shows that oh, the diamonds, it's it's rare to get diamonds ha having carat hard and carat carat size higher than two. So most times it's lesser than lesser than two and and the likes. Can you see unusual patterns? Well, well. Well, yes, the initial patterns is just at um, at one point at certain values we have a spike. So it's okay, possibly something when something happened around there, which I be come to um, find out about as we check the data as we um, explore the data more. So the next is um, a plot. Now see your applications. Sorry, I just got a message here that says participants can now see my application from Zoom. I don't know if it has been visible all along. Just to confirm. It's visible. It's okay. visible, yes, we can see. Okay. So from my hand so, anyway. Um, okay, okay, okay. Okay. At this point, um, we're actually plotting um, this graph from the same data set that was um, the modified data sets of, um, of the diamonds data set, like the smaller version, like the smaller, the smaller data set from diamonds. This time around, we fitted the um, diamonds with car size lesser than three. And looking at this plot, we find out that they were actually, um, the same thing we observed from the, the, the last one, there were spikes at some points and then it goes down and there's smaller spikes, then just have this randomness in the data. And so we can notice some clusters, clusters, but some of them are not fully formed, like, like fully, it's not really showing, but it's just something to show that, oh, there's a distinct, um, a distinct group here and there's another distinct group here and we'll get to find out more about that. And also, I noticed that the bin width um, arguments in the geomistogram function does a whole lot of help in zooming to get more details about, say, the clusters or the um, the data set as we go along. So subgroups create more questions. But for each of these um, clusters or subgroups, you can actually ask more questions and then explore for them and find out, okay, what is really causing like depression? Because this is still just one... Um, one um, variable we are looking at, just one column of the data that we're looking at. So I look, is there variation existing in this column? What exactly are the groups that we can identify from this column? What exactly are the things we can see that makes, um, how are the observation within each cluster similar to each other? Okay, and how are the observation in separate cluster different from each other? How can one explain or describe it? And um, why might the appearance of clusters be, be misleading? Sorry, give me. Um, some seconds, I want to. Okay, I'm back. Then use code, code. There's, there's another um, function that makes it easy for one to zoom in and to see unusual values. Okay, just like, um, although what the Bingwe does is like, it makes it, Possible to see, it's like um, working with like the I'll like explain now like the bars the, the bars like one can see it in different um, MC dimensions for now I 
I'm not getting the statistical downs right. But I know it's but the code Cartesian now makes the code Cartesian makes it easy to get to see okay, where exactly um one can actually zoom in with, with that. Let me go to the next slide and then get to talk about missing values or okay. I think we'll still come to that. We we'll still would do some um we still go through some of the yes, missing values. Let's talk about missing values now. There was supposed to be something here. It's been the next slide then. Okay, for missing values, missing values actually could mean different things for different data sets. Sometimes missing values could and missing values are handled differently for different data sets. So most times we need to find out what a missing value represents from say um, the organization one is working for or where one gets got the data from if one didn't get data once. So there's one option which is to drop the entire row containing the missing value. Although this is not very advisable. For example, if you want to have data that has a lot of missing values, by the time one drops all rows having missing values, one could end up having um, data sets with very little um very little rules to work with and might not um, give the right interpretation to what that population or that um, sample is saying as regards that um research or um business decisions we made as regards those people okay we could replace the bad data with any that's another option and most times this is an option that is adopted depending on what the missing value represents we could replace the bad data with any mean um meaning because i know n a n not a number but i i i have can someone help me any means um it's not coming let me check anybody has dropped on the chats is anybody dropped there any n means not a number is just something that you Let's get back to this. I uh, used to know all three, but I don't know. It's just didn't come today. Okay, so um, one could easily, <clears throat> one could easily um, how to replace um a data with NA. One could use the if else function and use this time around. We use the mutate um function as in diamonds. And pass the mutate function to. What is those is? Okay, someone, someone dropped the message. Let me see. Not available. Yes, yes, not available. I know NAN is not a number. And which other one? I think there are three or so. I don't know. But I know. Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Toda, Mr. Daniel. So um, what this does is if else, why um, greater than less than lesser than it means RM removed. Yeah, okay, RM removed. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Maria. So um why lesser than three or why? Greater than 20. So, what we are trying to do here for the diamonds data set is we notice that I think, okay, for the diamonds data set, let's just check what's like in our study because I know there's an X, Y, Z um, colon also in the diamonds data set. Okay, okay, okay. Check. Find out what it's about. It's in value. Okay. The diamonds data set, we have a colon that's, that's for X, Y, Z, and What the diamonds that I say look like. I think it's actually in but we need the function from our package. 
those are two. Yeah, so um, is the R Studio beautiful? Let me see. Anyone? Hello. Okay. Hello. Yes, we are with you. We are with you. Okay. Okay. I was asking if the house studio is there. Okay, I think some of the footage. Yes, okay. Um, you have the X colon or the variable X variable, Y variable, and Z variable. And this represents, I think, the dimension of diamond. Um, and I think it's not um, it's rare to have diamonds of those shape, like three and above 20. I think that's one of the reasons why we are actually taking Taking using that um, particular using that condition in the if and else statement. So what that does is, if this is um, if okay, I think someone dropped the message. So remove the outliers. Maybe yes, yes, yes. Remove the outliers. So um, if we have because the outliers may actually be um, error um, data written or let's say error data taking an error taking data or some yeah data taken by error yeah. Something like that. So, if for all statements we know that if one of them is true, then that becomes true. So the second argument there just represents that with any, and um, the second argument means any. So y becomes any, or y remains y if none of the conditions are true. So if one of the conditions is true, it changes the data to any. So I think that's that. And um, G plus will give a one when when values are missing. G plus two works like um, I think in the book it was um, compared to one other package that you can see works just like another package, um, how it works with this value. So one could just add um, the argument RM is true. Move the warning, to suppress the warning. Okay, so um, 7.5, talking about co variation, tendencies or values of different variables to vary together in a related way. Visualizing covariance depends on types of variables in the pair. Categorical plus continuous and variable. This means for this, um, for this, we would be using the box plots because we noticed that for the frequency polygon, we're not really getting to see the distinct um, difference in the levels. Um, it was kind of mumbled up, especially in a situation where we have more levels than that. Because for that particular plot, let me just go back. For that particular plot, we only have we have just five levels. And for that reason, we could still see what was going on. But should we have more than that, it could be quite a challenge viewing what really is going on in, in the data set. So that's why I think um, a box plot would be the best, best fit. So let's check out this tutorial by Cedric Shera to get more insight on how he goes about um, getting to explore data um, using box plots. Okay, from, from what he did here, I noticed that um, this is actually um, error bars. I think it's called a dynamite plot or something. Yeah, dynamite plots. Yes. And he actually just depicted with this uh, mem that um, this is actually a no, no. Oh, sorry, is the Pop, like I just clicked on the link to the, I don't know if it's visible. Okay. We can't see, no, oh, 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 good. So I think I would check. No, we can't see it. Okay, I'll make corrections to that now. Um, can you see it now? Let me check the chat. Yes, yes, we can. Oh, great, 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 great. So what happened here is, these are the dynam dynamite plots by um, Cedric, I think. He was just using it to explain that it's not really the best way to visualize um, data or to explore data because there's so much more the, um, okay. Thank you, okay, okay. There's so much more one can see from the rain cloud plot. I think this is a box plot and this actually, this is a frequency, I think density, yes. Just like it tells you, okay, is there a normal um, distribution around the data? So with this one can easily 
depict okay what's going on because the, this middle um, line here represents the median then this is actually intercortal inter range and we have the outliers um below coming whiskers below the below and above the um the box here so with this we can interpret and it's very important one knows how to actually interpret what box plot is, is saying but i'll still work more on interpreting it and really learn how to like say a whole lot about it and you also mentioned several things about violin plots and how how he um Okay, let's take a walk through what he did. Visualizing distribution as box and whisker plot is common practice, at least for researchers. Even though box plots are great in summarizing data, an issue is that the underlying data structure is hidden. And in this short I'll show okay why boxes can be problematic and how to improve them. Okay, with this, he used a lot of package in um in um in the crown network and G plus GGDist plus GG halves, GGB swarm, and should we not want to install them for several reasons? Possibly for um, at the same time, can I still go ahead and install them and see what um, see what these packages, what these plots will look like when we work on this? And also, let me quickly chip in this. I, I, I saw Priyanka, one of um, the our ladies, um, meetup. I, I saw what she did with data exploration. She used this package, Data Explorer, and it really explained a lot about how to go about exploring the data. Okay, let's quickly take this. I, I might show one or two things, maybe towards the end of the, the class, if it's the half time, what I actually used it for, and I was able to keep okay, let's take this now. Okay, box plots are great. Box plots and arts were combining many semester statistics into one chart type. But in my, okay. What I did here was, this is a box plot and Really, we can, these are three groups, and we can't really specify where the difference are. It's just like they are, they are the same. I wish to see what the data was like. So tell me, how big is the sample size? Are the underlying parts and that are difficult? Adding a note on the sample size might be considered good possible. It does not tell you much about the actual part. So for this, we can actually spot any pattern in these three groups. I think, yeah, so I think we should use this and check something. Um, probation now. Okay, so I'll drop the message. Such a good is a nice one. Help to understand this gives ideas. Oh, true, true. Yeah. So, um, category. Okay. So I, I think we'll still go back to Cedric's um article and still get to check one or two things. But from here, we can see that despite the fact the the groups are different sized. We still have almost the, the means are at this. The median is still the same, and the outliers are just different for I think group two, group one and group three have the same, very the same um outliers and all, but it's still much more different. But now doing something like this, we can now see that oh, there's a whole lot of some data points are, are, are clouded in some areas why some are just scattered around. So you can see that, oh, something is really different in this data, but if you just had the plain box plots, might not have noticed any difference in the groups. But now with this, we have a better view and we can say, okay, there's something different in this data set. There's something going on. And from there, we can begin to ask more questions and, and, and dive deeper into knowing much more about, about the, the data. So let me go back to the R for data science book. Okay. Now this is what the box plot is like. It's a bit in the box plots. I'll try to explain. Um, above the whiskers, we have the outliers. Some and um, whiskers to farthest. Then we have the whisker that says um, whiskers to farthest non outlier point. Okay. Then the topmost part of the box is the scientific. Center, the 50th percentile is also the median and the 25th percentile. So from the 75th percentile to 25th percentile is actually the quarter range. And then we have those other parts. Okay, so let's see what 
Let's take a look at the distribution of price by cutting the cuts using geom box plot. So the cuts are actually available in the diamonds data sets, and it represents like the cuts. It's it's a factor. It's a it's a data set. It's it's, a, it's an other level than available. Yes, we have fair good. I think I mentioned that before. But now, if we look at this, we'll spot something that um. We can see that there's, there's distinct um, difference in the median across the across the um, the court. We have the ideal um, court having um, a lower median compared to the rest of them. Although, okay, fair is worse than good, which is worse than very good, and so on. Many categorical variables don't have such an intrinsic order, so you might want to the other them to make more information. One way to do that is use the reorder function. So we can also use the reorder function to reorder our, our data sets to get more insight on where exactly is where exactly is this um is this difference or where exactly is this all um where can we spot this difference and find out what's really going on in the in the data set. But this time around, we're using in, in the next um chunk of data that was run in the textbook, we find out that it was the the, um, the MPG data set that was used. And this time around, we have um, two variables that a, a continuous variable and a categorical variable. We looked at here because we're still dealing with scope variation. And here we find out that, oh, using the reorder function now, we find out that we, we can really spot the, the um, level in the categorical variable with the lowest median. And with this order, we can spot, okay. Pick up actually has the lower the lowest median, and followed by SUV, minivan, two seaters, subcompact, subcompact, compact, and mid size. And there's another function that can make it possible to um to to see the long variable names, and this is by flipping the plot by ninety degrees. That we use the cord flip um function. With that, we can be able to spot what's going on. We have some exercises, and this will take us back to the um, cancel and non-cancel flights. I, I, I mentioned this. I mentioned this. Yes. I don't think I mentioned this, but I think somewhere, yeah. somewhere here. Um, I think the exercise we can still try that. Uh, uh, but let me go back to the book down. Um, mark down documents and continue from there so we can serve time. So we have, um, we could also um, view data, check out covariation by two, using two categorical um, variables. And at this point, we use the um, geom count function, then the geom tau. The rest of the down just have everything summarized. Uh, at this point, we'll go back to the Power for Data Science book and continue from there. Okay. 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 So I'm flipping this. We can easily just notice um, where we could. Where we could still but explore the data. So two categorical variables, yes. So let's use this. To visualize the cooperation between two categorical variables, one needs to count the number of observations for each um, combination. One way to do that is to rely on the built-in geom count. So doing this, we are checking out the and diamonds data set again. And from here we can find we, we find out that the dots with the bigger dots actually represent larger counts compared to compared to the smaller dots. So we can see that the um the ideal courts had higher um numbers of um like more diamonds are represented represented in the ideal in the ideal court. Okay, the size of each circle, same thing, the size of the circle is in the plot displays how many observations occurred at each combination of values, and then correlation will appear as strong correlation between specific x and specific y value. Okay. Another approach is to compute the count with the deployer um, package. 
at this point, we we can easily just take a bit a, a summary that tells us oh, we have about um, for the amounts with color D, E, or F, swan into jewelry would really be able to um, understand what exactly these um, variables represent. Like most diamonds are actually, I think they have color grades A to I think F or so or more than I think H. I think it's still H or so. Just check the levels and we'll find out from there we can. Okay, for this particular data set, what just happened here is they were graded based on their colors, the cuts, and also the number of um, diamonds that are in each of these levels. And we visualize this using the geometer um, term function, and that's what we have here. So here we find out that oh, we have more um, diamonds that are ideal and also of the color gray G compared to say um, the fair um, category at D or J, they have more, they have a lesser count. Then if the category variables are on order, you might want to use the um, seriation package to simultaneously reorder the rules and colons in order to, to more clearly review interesting patterns. So the more patterns we discover, or the more we can actually explore further and ask more questions. The good thing about exploratory data analysis is about asking questions creatively. And to ask questions creatively means you ask lots of questions. And in so doing, you have to like, Do more, um, check out the data in so many ways, get some questions, and some will need to, um, it, it end, like, you don't need to bother them because you feel okay, there's nothing to check out here. You have to go back and ask more questions, find, um, um, where one can get, um, answers to some questions and find where there are patterns, like where there are like variations, and from there, one can go forward and do other things. Okay, we have some exercises. How could you rescale the count that I said above to more clearly show distribution of cuts within color or color within or color within cuts? Um, which of the exercises I think we can do that on our own? And if you have any challenge, I, I some people of actually came up with um, solutions to most of the exercise, and there's a book down document that we want to do. That and it's actually, I think, a link to, to this document are actually on this Slack channel. And so we'll, we'll proceed to two continuous variables. I hope you don't mind, but for mind, you could still just take out take the exercises. Do we mind? Okay, we can do the exercises. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, and let me see. Okay, yes, yeah, sure. Okay, let's try the exercises then. How could you scale the count data set above to more, more clearly show the distribution of cuts within, within color? Okay. So I actually don't have this. Um, I don't have this, but let me just copy the code then. Okay, let's see. Copy. That's our studio.
you can try your other try from the previous example. Okay. So please give me one, just give me a few seconds. Okay, we can try to build that from the previous example. Okay. Back to ours. Hold
sorry for the um link. I okay back to this. Um actually I had not read the old thing, so I actually didn't have to check some things. Do we other really okay? Matthew, do you, do you do you think we should kind of solve it by ourselves? So we just we do it like a uh, take home. I'll probably come back to you let's say on Slack. Um mm -hmm. uh, so that we can finish the chapter itself. Because I think we just have maybe two more lessons to go and we have like 10 minutes there about. Okay, okay, okay. And there's no problem. Uh, I just checked, sorry, I actually didn't prepare for the exercises. I was just reading through the own books and I'm really sorry about that. I would have worked on that last night. Yeah, it's fine. It's, it's understandable. Okay. okay, so um, what I was thinking was, I actually saw the solution. I was actually looking for a solution. I found it, but it seems to be very, very, very seem long. And I, I think this idea is actually good. We could just do it. For some reasons, I actually didn't solve the exercises immediately. I'm really sorry for that. Uh, okay, so um, let me go back to the... But this is what it looks like. Okay. So it is really long and it's really, really long. And that's what it looks like. Let's see what we have. Okay. Yeah, color and color back. Okay, this is what it looks like. Motion cut in color. Okay, I think there's a message. No, I was saying I get to oh sorry. I I didn't change that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so this is what's this is what it looks like, and I think there's there's a whole and there's a whole lot with that. So let's go to the next one. I actually wanted to share something else towards the end of the class, though something I was working on. Okay, also continuous plus continuous. We could also um, get this done, but this time around, it's more like geom points. Then from there, you could use more um, smell that cruise. Oh, you saw it right. That's what the solution is like. It's that lengthy so imagine i was right all that from my head like imagine i was right that all from my head like it would have been interesting to see but but well enough I should have been able to easily just explain but i would have found some difficulties though okay so um i think that just have from the book down we are done with what's on that book down i think yes we are done with what's there I think that's just the last part of it. Um, planning pattern. So ask yourself, could this pattern be due to coincidence, random chance? How can you describe the relationship implied by the pattern? How strong the relationship implied by the pattern? What other variables might affect the relationship? Okay, some messages. But let's real, but let's try the other. I think we should be able to pull something from it. Though I'm not sure about the heat map thing. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, you know what you do for me, Mr. I think um at DME. You could just drop the code please, and I will just paste it. I want us to like finish chapter six. Uh, no, 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 no. I was just referring to it that we can do it on our own. Sorry. Uh, okay, it wasn't okay, okay, meant okay, for okay. you. Sorry. Okay, 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 okay. No problem. No problem. No problem. So um the whole thing is about those discovering patterns when it comes to working with these different goes in, in, a, in a data set. And once these patterns are, are, are discovered, to show some relationship and from there, we begin to um, explore more like using visualization or or possibly using some other forms of tests to, to find out. Okay, then simplify ggplot2. Simplify ggplot2. Uh, ggplot data is 
the, the data here is the faithful data set. Um, this uh, old case here, faithful data set, and as to these eruptions that that took place. So we had from this data set, we can see that this is clearly um, two distinct clusters here, and one cluster is within like say um, 1.5 to 0.5, and the other cluster is around um, 3.75 to 5 or say point yes five five so we have about two clusters here and it shows that oh, through visualization we can get to see patterns and from there work out what what can be what can be done but the the um the code written actually has um the code has different variants and from there we can see that the, the first code actually has each argument written and the and it takes an object for the next set of codes, we see that it's quite different. We also have the um, objects in there without the argument of like the mapping or data. And for the third one, I think that's John's way of doing it. We use the um, add and we're able to also um, do that. Then to learn more, you can check the r4ds.io slash join for more book clubs. And, and that is that for the book down document. But let me just quickly check if there's anything that I had not covered here. Two continuous variables. Okay. Very one great way to visualize the cooperation between two continuous from draw a scatter plot with geom points. And you can see cooperation as a pattern in the points. Okay, this is actually a, a, a plot of two continuous variable price and cart. And from here we can we can see that um the data are the data, the data points are kind of mumbled together in different ways, but we can see that oh, there's a pattern, but the data is just mumbled together and we we'll need to like do more things to see what's really going on in data. And for that reason, we had to the we had to actually use the argument alpha to be able to note to note the the um the difference in like the distinct what's distinct about um the data at, at several points in the at several points. Okay, uh, and there are several other ways we can actually get to find out what exactly is going on. We could use, um, okay, yes, but using transparent can be challenging for very large data sets. Another solution is to use bin. Previously used geo histogram and geo sequence, um, nice sequence polygon to bin in one dimension. Now you learn how to use geo bin to do. This is just us talking about, okay. See one way to fix problem. Okay, to add more transparency. This we can get to see. Okay, what's really going on? Pattern that can be um, spotted. But okay, as the prices increases, the the the, the, um, the higher the card prices, the higher the prices. Like the higher the carat sizes, and then the higher the prices of the um of the diamond. And I think that's just that's just logical. Um. So also we have the same thing happening here, but we still want to spot if there's any um difference or something we are not seeing from the data set. So that's how we have this we have a box plot showing showing outliers at several points in time and how you could have some two diamonds with carats of just one still having prices that are higher than that of um carat and um, diamonds with carat of just that is like five thousand. I don't know if it's dollars or let's just say five thousand dollars in price. It shows that oh, some other factors may be contributing to this because now we just have to continue to see. Could have other factors like maybe categorical factor like color, AD, maybe the, this particular card. Um, if A was the highest um, valued color, it could, be, it could be that for this card that is one and we have the price to be at over one fifteen thousand dollars. It could be that that particular um, diamond as an outlier, the topmost outlier there could be. That it's of that high quality um, color grid, and that's why the price is higher than that. So there may be other um, factors affecting or causing there to be outliers in, in several of these um, data data points. So the more we explore the data, the more we get to see some more things. And yes, this is where the bin thing comes to play. Yes, I think this is it. Okay, grouping. Okay, this is the part where we group. Okay, it's not the bin part yet. 
when we um, put it in, put the, um, the data set in, in group, in the, that's the June box plot mapping aesthetics group um, cut number carat comma 20, we have the, um, the box plots in different dimension at this point in time. And from there, we can also see different patterns in, in the data set. And from there, we can go further and explore to find out oh, what other factors or what other variables could be the cause of um, these um, distinctions in the data set. We have another exercise here, which my likely skip and go to 7.6. Although this data set actually shows why it's plot better than better display than a bind plot for this case. Okay, this is also one of the exercises. I think we should also check this out and find out what why it, it is so. So patterns and models, which will come, come across later on as we go through the book. Pattern in, patterns in your data provide clues about relationship. If a systemic relationship exists between two variables, it will appear as a pattern in data. If you spot a pattern, ask yourself, could this pattern be due to coincidence? Yes, yeah, just like a question, it could be that that could be a color grade, it could be that it could actually be of the same and color grade and price just differ, maybe due to some other factors or just not be. It may just be the price, it's just the only thing that made them differ. It could just be due to coincidence or random chance. And how can you describe the relationship implied by the pattern? How strong is the relationship implied by a pattern? And what other variables might affect the relationship? Let's say, for example, um, I really don't know how the jewelry or the diamond exploration thing works, but should it be that I can just find, instead of going all the way to look for rare um, diamonds with um, card size of, say, three or four or five, if I could find ones like card size of um, diamonds, card size of ones, I could just um, look for the ones with a particular color grade and sell those ones to get higher value. And maybe that's just help the company make a better business and possibly just um, creating a better sense of forming. I think clustering, explain, explain the like the mining area to find such diamonds of such uh, um, correct size or so. I, I believe there were ways these things are drawn and actually, and one will be able to get this um, drill, um, this diamonds. Does relation change if you look at individual subgroups of the of the data? Now, if we spot a, possibly a pattern, does it in say the entire group or in a subgroup? Is this pattern consistent along the groups? And if so, what exactly can we can we deduce from that? A scatter plot of old faithful eruption lens versus the wait time between eruptions shows a pattern. Longer wait times are associated with longer eruptions, and the scatter plot also displays the two clusters that we noticed above. The simplified to plot two um, that we looked at earlier actually is what was presented here in this, this scatter plot, and it just shows the um, the two. Um, the two um, clusters. At this point, we, we can still see that there's linear. The higher the the, the okay, the higher the eruption, the longer the time of waiting. I think more the I think the more the eruption. I think it's got, okay. It's, it's, it's a linear. It's got a lot of wait time. So the wait time between eruption shows a pattern. Longer wait time associated longer eruptions. And that's what's actually depicted in the, the scatter plot. Patterns provide one of the most useful tools for data scientists because they reveal cool variation. And so when we start doing more of modeling, we get to see how these things uh, uh, how, how they work out and like. I think that's that's it for, the, for today's class. And I think I mentioned, I've shown this in the down documents that this part of the deep plot data set of the faithful, I think of the, yes, the faithful data set of last time and deep down. And I think I've mentioned, I've shown this and I'm done, I'm done Mr. Daniel. Okay. I don't know if we have anything we want to say. Sorry for the last part of this um, discussion. I, I got a bit nervous and Mr. Daniel. Uh, I don't think I have anything though. I mean, thank you very much. It's been it's been a very exciting last three lessons, I guess. You've kind of helped us through the entire process itself for the last three classes. So I guess that's fine. Uh, so again, we'll meet again next week, same time. 
I will be taking Tibus. Um, I will probably go from there. But thank you, thank you very much, Matthew. I think this has been good. We do have some exercises that we do need to uh, clear out on, I guess. Um, uh, I will probably you know, put those in the Slack channel itself. Uh, but I'm sure we'll probably go through the chapter again to kind of see how we can understand the chapter a bit more. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank um, you so very much, no Matthew. Take, Thank you. Yeah. There's no need to take the workflow chapter, right? I don't think so. So, so the workflow chapter, I, I, from what I've figured out, it seems like it's like basics of R, right? Um, so I think yeah. this workflow chapter itself kind of talks about how to set a work drive, for example. Um, uh, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. I, I think it's something that we can easily learn by ourselves. And it's pretty scattered across um, every two or three chapters in the book itself. It just puts some extra nuggets itself on how to okay. work with R itself. Um, so I, I think it's fine. I don't think it's a problem. Okay. Okay, no problem then. All right. Thank you very much, Matthew. All the best. Yeah. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.